Okay. Yes. Okay. Now it's starting. Uh -huh. cool. Okay. Good to go. <laughs> Sweet. Um, yes. Yeah, so today's presentation is going to be loosely based on a, um, a fact paper from 2023. It's called The Many Faces of Fairness exploring the institutional logics of multi-stakeholder micro lending recommendation. And um, I'm going to use this paper to discuss some of the like topics that I'm going to go over today, but I'm actually also going to start with a pretty big preface on just like fairness in general and um, some of the more like philosophical aspects of fairness as opposed to like computer science. So um, just put this up. First, I just want to briefly introduce myself. I am uh, Jesse or Jess, I go by both, and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of Colorado in Boulder, um, the USA. And my research areas are machine learning, fairness, AI ethics broadly, um, designing toolkits and guidebooks for machine learning practitioners, it recommender systems, translating ethics and goals and amorphous subjective I ideals into empirically observable metrics. And more recently, I've started to delve into the world of generative AI ethics and helping practitioners identify and mitigate harms that could arise from their systems. So um, when people ask me, I just say AI ethics broadly because it's, it's a little bit of everything. And uh, this is sort of the agenda for today. I'm gonna begin by going over um, some theories of fairness, and then we'll get into the specifics of, of the research study from the paper. So fairness, what is fairness? Um, something that I've noticed in the computer science and machine learning scholarship and just research disciplines generally, is that it seems like fairness is becoming this really exciting buzzword that um, people are really like energized to conduct research on, and they're really eager to dive into experimental results or A-B tests for things like fairness metrics. But a lot of this work is done without critically examining what this fairness thing is in the first place. And because fairness itself is like really rooted in social science and philosophy and a lot of disciplines that are not computer science, I, I figured maybe we would start there. So we're gonna start off with a bit of uh, moral philosophy and ethical theories, just to, to ground ourselves in this concept and construct of fairness. And so fairness itself is really tricky to define. It's something that if I were to ask you, how do you define fairness? You might have a hard time describing it really concisely, but it's pretty intuitive. So even if you can't define it, you kind of know it when you see it. And we all have this intuition around what fairness is or what it isn't. And part of that intuition is really influenced by our personal upbringing and our lives and our cultural backgrounds. So all this is just to say that fairness is super, super subjective. And it's not only subjective, it's also philosophical, unobservable, immeasurable, theoretical, contested, and a context-based construct. So because of this, it is really, really challenging to actually accurately and appropriately attempt to measure and optimize and operationalize this super subjective construct. And if I were to try to define fairness in just like one sentence, I would say something like fairness is a normative concept surrounding the distribution of value and utility. So basically it's about when benefits or harms are not distributed equally or equitably between people. And so you can imagine like if somebody was to create a technological system that harmed everyone in the world, we might say, well, that's really unfair. But if it harmed everyone equally by some ethical frameworks, technically it would be fair. So fairness and harm are related, but they are not the same because fairness is much more about how that harm is distributed and whether or not it's distributed in an equal way. And so some different enactments of fairness that you've probably either seen or maybe experienced, witnessed, heard of is um, equality. So this is when everyone is given access to the same resources or opportunities. That's this one on the left here. Um, so everybody's given the same little box to see the, the baseball game. But as you can see, this does not actually ensure an equal outcome. There's somebody who can't see the game. This person can barely see the game. This person's just chilling. And then you have this idea of equity 
which is when we recognize that not everybody comes from the same background, the same opportunities, the same abilities. And so instead we wanna to try to ensure equal outcomes. So now maybe not everybody gets a box to stand on, <clears throat> but everybody can see the game the same. And then there's this concept of liberation, which is this idea that we should critically examine and question the system that we're working within and try to dismantle systems of power and oppression and solve the problems at their root. So questioning like, why is there a fence in the first place? Let's just all watch the game. And uh, there's a lot of great work happening with uh, critical liberatory technological design, um, which is really exciting and fascinating. And so since fairness is a theoretical construct, as I mentioned before, this means that you cannot directly observe or measure it. So you cannot empirically and objectively observe and measure the construct of fairness because it is so theoretical and subjective. And this means that although we do currently have methods to evaluate and improve fairness in the field of recommendation and ranking and information access as well, in order to understand the implications of these approaches, we actually need to conduct interdisciplinary research. Otherwise, we'll just be measuring for the sake of measuring without actually understanding what the implications or the impacts of those measurements are. So there are four main theories of um, moral philosophy, I should say Western theoretical approaches to moral philosophy that are really common in the literature. And in this work, the paper that I'm going to dive into in a bit, we, we drew from these four theories. So I just want to quickly introduce all of them. So we have contract-based ethics, consequence-based ethics, character-based ethics, duty-based ethics. And um, what we did in this work is we basically took these ethical, like moral, philosophical frameworks, and we tried to create a fairness framework that aligned with each of them. So um, you can see that here, like contract-based ethics has this fairness framework here, same with consequence. So I'm gonna go through each of these one by one. Starting with consequence-based ethics, this is rooted in um, Bentham and Mill's theory of utilitarianism, which um, I'm, I'm sure probably most people here have heard of that, at least in some capacity. And so um, the, the most common form of, of utilitarianism is rule utilitarianism, which is the idea that you wanna maximize the most good for the most people while also taking some kind of justice into account. So you're trying to decide who deserves a positive outcome based on some kind of cost benefit analysis. So if you've ever heard of the trolley problem, utilitarianism is a really uh, common approach to this problem. When you're like, how many people should the runaway trolley kill? One or five, people will usually say, one, because one death is better than five deaths. It's sort of like a numbers game for ethics. Um, but then you can also start to question like who deserves to live? Is the one person a doctor and the five people are robbers? Well, maybe then in a cost benefit analysis, the one doctor deserves to live over the five bank robbers. So it's really about deciding in your mind, like what, how can we maximize the benefit and minimize the cost? And so in recommender systems, this would be this could be enacted by um, trying to design a recommender system that would recommend the items that make the biggest positive impact first, or maybe downranking items that have negative impact. And so, if we think about this in terms of fairness, then we could say fairness for consequence-based ethics <clears throat> is about maximizing positive outcomes. Okay, so contract-based ethics is rooted in Rawls' theory of distributive justice which um, the most common enactment of this is called equality of opportunity. There's a lot of laws, at least in the US, that are um, based off of this uh, concept. And the idea is basically that everyone should have an equal opportunity to receive a benefit from the system. And benefits are allocated based on if someone deserves to receive them, not based on their luck, not based on their fortune, <clears throat> not based on their social class or their background. And in this case, it's a little bit more like equity. So it tries to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity in the system, regardless of the opportunities that they've been given before. So it's trying to put everybody on that level playing field, maybe giving some people several boxes to stand on, giving some people no boxes to stand on, that idea. And so um, for fairness, this idea would be that fairness is based on social contracts and also human rights. We're really trying to uplift people who have not been given equal opportunities. And so in recommender systems, an example of inequality of opportunity would be popularity bias. 
And so popularity bias is this like phenomena and recommendation and ranking where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. You have um, items that are really, really popular like Kanye West or Taylor Swift on uh, Spotify. They become super popular. And because of that, they're recommended more, which makes them become more popular versus the, the music from the niche budding artist that never gets recommended and stays unpopular because it never gets recommended. And so it's sort of like a, a doom spiral. So um, in recommender systems, popularity bias would mean that not everyone has equal opportunity to benefit from the system. So that would be inequality of opportunity. So next up is character-based ethics, which is rooted in Aristotle's theory of virtue ethics. And this is all about intention, not impact. So this is basically just saying everything is context dependent and subjective. We don't have a universal fairness rule that we need to follow. Everything is sort of up to discretion. And um, in fairness, this is really about judging people based on their character, not their actions. And so if we were to relate this to recommender systems, um, and designing recommender systems, you might say, well, instead of us as an organization, um, like pushing our own fairness ideologies, we're just going to let end users make their own decisions about what items or people or things that they want to be recommended or ranked highly because they can use their own discretion to judge their own um, version of fairness and what they think is fair or not. And then finally, we have duty-based ethics, which is based off of Kant's theory of deontology. And um, deontology it basically describes that there's a certain, uh, there's a set of rules that result from morals and values. And no matter what, we do not break those rules. So even if we think that somebody has amazing character, they've never done anything wrong, as soon as they do something wrong, we are still going to punish them for it because we don't care about their character. We only care about their actions. And we, we do not ever break the rules that we set for ourselves. And so fairness in this sense would be about consistently following those rules. So making sure that once you have set the rules, you do not um, bend based on your personal discretion. You only ever follow those rules. So in recommender systems, if an organization were to make a promise to its stakeholders in a deontological system, it would need its system would need to reflect those promises. It can't break those promises. And um, you can imagine an example like a dating app. So if the system were to claim um, like Hinge, for example, if it were to claim, okay, we do not perpetuate or amplify racism through our recommendations, then if they wanted their system to be deontologically ethical, they would need to ensure that their system does not perpetuate racism through their recommendations. So it's really just about like sticking to your values and your principles and your rules that you have like explicitly mentioned or determined. All right, so now that our philosophy class is done, I'll get into the, the actual paper. And I'm going to start with a bit of a background for um, why we decided to do to um, to conduct the study that we conducted. And just a brief sneak peek. This is an interview study with employees at an organization called Kiva. And we were trying to understand how they enacted fairness in their recommender systems. So um, as I'm sure you all are aware, academics and industry practitioners have become increasingly interested in improving fairness of recommender systems for various reasons. And although this is really promising research, there are some um, challenges and obstacles that stand in the way of this work. So first, the application of um, machine learning research has been limited in part because these complex organizational structures that fairness emerges within are understudied. And second, the published research in machine learning often considers only one protected group of stakeholders that fairness should be considered for, which is really an unrealistic constraint for most applications, especially recommendations. They're often multi-stakeholder systems. And finally, there's a lack of research that explores the complexity of real world industry practices around fairness, which sometimes results in this oversimplification of the concept of fairness. And this means that results from fairness aware machine learning research often lack relevance for practitioners. They're really more theoretical. And our site of study was, as I mentioned before, this organization called Kiva Microfunds. So Kiva is a nonprofit organization that uses microlending to provide access to capital for individuals who are financially underserved or excluded. So basically, they try to help provide access to money or credit for people who don't have access to banks or credit accounts. And this is primarily women and primarily countries in developing markets. 
So anyone can navigate to kiva.org and help contribute any amount of money as part of a loan that someone needs. That's why they're called micro loans. So if somebody, for example, wanted like $2,000 to help something on their farm, they could contribute, like anyone could contribute, I think, as little as maybe like $5 to that 2000 And so eventually the loan can get fulfilled in its entirety, but there is a deadline. So you only have 30 days, I believe, to actually fulfill a loan completely or else it gets taken off the site. Otherwise, they would just have too many loans to deal with on their website. So the main, the key stakeholders of Kiva are the lenders. So these are people like um, you and me. These are people who go to kiva.org. They use their money to help fund the posted loans. We also have the lending partners. These are local organizations who support the borrowers in their loan application and repayment process. The borrowers themselves, like Asunta, who you can see on this slide, and these are the individuals and small groups who ultimately receive the loans and funding from Kiva. And then there's the organization itself, Kiva, which has an interest in keeping money flowing through their online marketplace by helping lenders find borrowers that they would like to lend to. So they really have a vested interest in making sure that money is being lent and money is being repaid. Otherwise, they don't have a marketplace. And since many people need funding around the world, there are many, many loans posted on the Kiva website. And because of this, Kiva's incorporated recommendation and ranking algorithms to help filter loans on their platform. So like, imagine that you are somebody who wants to lend money on Kiva. You navigate to the website, and then you're shown a variety of, of recommended loans that you could help fund. Like, for example, maybe this carousel right here on the screen. So a huge part of Kiva's mission is to improve a global financial inclusion, which means that their recommendation and ranking algorithms are a crucial component to improving fairness through their platform. And this is because the loans that are recommended and ranked higher on the platform are statistically much more likely to get funded. So they are sort of playing God in a way by deciding who gets um, to be ranked or recommended more highly than other loans because those are, loans are more likely to get funded. So in this research, we wanted to understand how fairness is currently incorporated into Kiva's recommendation ecosystem, and also how it could be incorporated based on the practices and actions of employees. And to explore this, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 23 employees from Kiva just to see how they enact different fairness logics through their work. So a fairness logic is the organizing principles and patterns of practice that guide and shape how individuals carry out fairness in their own work. <clears throat> so specifically, our three research questions here were, um, first, what fairness logics are in Kiva's recommendations and which stakeholders are prioritized? Second, how do these fairness logics complement or conflict with one another? And third, which designs might prioritize different fairness logics or different stakeholders? So let me just briefly describe what we did here. We interviewed 23 Kiva employees, each with a job role that related to loan recommendations on Kiva's website. And during interviews, we asked our participants about how they apply the value of fairness in their work. Then we conducted a thematic analysis on our interview transcripts where we categorized participant responses into associated fairness logics. And we mapped out where different fairness logics might overlap with each other or conflict with each other. Okay, so let's get into those results. These four fairness logics might look a little similar to you. So from our interviews, we identified four ways that fairness is or can be enacted through Kiva's loan recommendation ecosystem. And so this is what we referred to as our four fairness logics. So um, we have this consequence-based fairness logic, contract-based fairness logic, character-based fairness logic, and duty-based fairness logic. And they do align with each of those different um, ethical theories that I went over at the beginning of this talk. So I'm now gonna briefly describe examples of all four of these logics in action in relation to Kiva's recommendations. So let's start with consequence-based fairness. This is again, uh, rooted in act utilitarianism. So this is all about maximizing benefit and minimizing the cost. So in our interviews, one method to maximize benefit through Kiva's recommendations was to choose one loan to recommend that's the most impactful compared to all other loans. 
which participant five described is really hard to do because everybody needs help to some degree. So how do you determine which loans are more impactful or less impactful? And Kiva has its own methods of determining impact. They actually have an impact score that they um, give to every single loan. And it's uh, heavily researched how they uh, assign that impact. But again, impact is a subjective metric. So even if you come up with robust mathematical ways to um, measure and tag each loan with impact, it is still something that cannot be directly observed because it's, it's subjective. So one method to minimize cost through Kiva's recommendations was to recommend loans that are lower risk because the lender would be more likely to get paid back, which would allow them to reinvest that money in additional loans in the future. So you've got maximizing benefit, minimizing cost. Now let's move to contract-based fairness. So again, this is aligning with the concept of equality of opportunity which um, requires that everyone has a fair chance to receive benefits from a system. So for example, participant 19 described that since Kiva's mission is to make sure those who are most financially excluded are the ones getting funding, something that would be in line with this mission would be making sure that those who are financially excluded are the first ones seen on the site. So they were basically saying, hey, the goal here is that we're helping out the people who are underserved globally. Let's make sure that those are the people that we recommend first. Let's not recommend the person who wants a loan to make a coffee shop in the U.S. because they technically have much more access to capital than somebody who maybe wants a loan to help them build a school in like Eritrea or something. Okay, so moving on to character-based fairness now. Um, this focuses on the decision-making process that lenders go through when deciding who is worthy of a loan. So our participants described that some lenders wouldn't be as comfortable with character-based fairness because they kind of want Kiva to make that determination for them. And for example, um, participant 23 said there are some lenders who don't like choosing which loans to fund because they don't believe in themselves as an arbiter of who deserves funding. So they didn't want to like play God, for example. And then we have the final um, logic, which is duty-based fairness. So this confronts the rules, the duties, the responsibilities, and the accountability that Kiva has towards its various stakeholders. And depending on which rules are chosen for the platform, this logic could prioritize certain stakeholders over others. So here's an example from participant one who described that Kiva has a duty to its borrowers by making sure that the recommender system is not further perpetuating systemic racism or lack of access for certain borrowers. And so in this scenario, participant one really thought that Kiva has a duty to help its borrowers. And now in contrast, you have participant two who described that Kiva has a duty to its lenders so its duty is to make sure that lenders' money and repayment rates are protected to ensure that lenders are going to get their money back. And so on the one hand, you have one employee saying, well, Kiva should make sure that we recommend and rank items based on what the borrowers need. And then on the other hand, you have an employee saying, well, Kiva should recommend and rank loans based on what the lenders need. And so this sort of led us to understand that there are some tensions among and between and within these different logics. And so you might not be able to design for all of these logics at once because they might come into conflict with one another. And so we discovered three main tensions among the fairness logics. One of these tensions occurred within the consequence-based logic where some of our participants weren't sure if it was possible to both maximize impact and minimize risk at the same time. So for example, if Kiva wanted to maximize impact by recommending underserved borrowers from a certain region in the world, then those borrowers might be riskier to lend to. So this means that if we wanted to maximize impact, we would also be increasing lending risk. So we'd also be increasing cost. And in this scenario, participant eight suggested that Kiva, it's okay to sacrifice a bit of your risk aversion for the sake of being more impactful. So in other words, this participant thought that Kiva should prioritize borrowers over, lender, over lenders when deciding between maximizing benefit or mis minimizing risk. So this, this employee thought that benefit-based, um, consequence-based fairness was much better than cost-based, or more important, at least. 
So this also led us to discover that each of our fairness logics prioritize certain stakeholders over others. So if you were to enact certain logics within a recommendation platform design, then you might differentially prioritize certain stakeholders as well. So what we just saw was that um, in a uh, consequence-based logic, the organization is the overarching stakeholder, but then if you are trying to maximize benefit, the stakeholder is the, the borrower. If you're trying to minimize risk, the stakeholder is the lender. Um, in contract-based contract uh, fairness, the stakeholder that's prioritized is the borrower or the lending partner. Character-based is the lender. Duty-based is a little bit of uh, like a, an umbrella fairness logic because depending on the, the rules that you assign the organization to follow, it could really align with any given stakeholder. So um, that one's a little bit less related, but it is interesting because then the idea is that, well, if you do choose a certain kind of fairness, you're basically choosing to prioritize a certain stakeholder. And so we started to discuss what some of the impacts of this is on the design of recommendations and like a, a recommendation ecosystem, a platform that hosts recommendations. And so um, the way that we decided to grapple with all these overlaps and tensions between logics and stakeholders is we described how different designs of either the loans themselves or the recommendations of loans might align with one or multiple fairness logics and which stakeholders would be prioritized as a result of that design choice. So for example, um, if Kiva was to decide to rank the well-funded popular loans much more highly, then this would enact a character-based fairness logic because it's basically saying we want all of the lenders on the platform to um, use their own discretion and their discretion is based on what other people's discretion is. And so that, that's character-based fairness, um, but it does reinforce lender biases. So it helps the lender, but it might hurt or harm the borrower. And another example was, um, let's imagine you wanted to rank uh, low risk loans higher. So these are the loans that are more likely to get repaid. So this option would enact a consequence-based fairness logic that's focused on minimizing cost. And uh, again, this would help the lender because the lender is more likely to get paid back, but maybe it would hurt the borrower because the loans that are most likely to get repaid are the loans that come from um, countries that are a little bit more economically stable and, and borrowers who um, have more opportunity to get money to give money back. So it might harm the borrowers who are most in need, which is against Kiba's mission. So that would be against contract-based fairness. All right, so um, I'm just gonna conclude with a few thoughts about the study, some of the things that I discussed today. And also I just wanted to briefly mention some limitations um, because this was a qualitative study. So because of this, our findings are not generalizable beyond the context of micro lending recommendations on Kiva, but our methods of identifying fairness logics and analyzing the tensions and the trade-offs among these logics are generalizable and um, hopefully they can be useful for future research. And in general, we also um, were hoping that this research provides some methodological inspiration for how others might design fairness interventions based on an organization's values and practices. Um, it's kind of common practice these days to just choose the easiest fairness metric and uh, operationalization and intervention to enact in a system without really critically interrogating what the implications of that choice are. So hopefully this kind of research can help um, motivate different researchers and practitioners to like really think through what the impacts of those fairness choices are. Even if the intention is good, maybe the impact isn't exactly what they're expecting. So um, that that's where I will leave us all today. I have some discussion questions, Q and A, if, if we want to facilitate any sort of question asking and answering. But otherwise, thank you. <laughs>